This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors, such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors, or authors, are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone, or anything. According to ICSAHome.com, there are a few characteristics associated with cultic groups. Among these, the group displays excessively zealous and unquestioning commitment to its leader and, whether he is alive or dead, regards his belief system, ideology and practices as the truth, as law. Questioning, doubt and dissent are discouraged or even punished. The leader dictates, sometimes in great detail, how members should think, act and feel. For examples, members must get permission to date, change jobs, marry, or leaders prescribe what type of clothes to wear, where to live, whether or not to have children, how to discipline children, and so forth. The group has a polarized us versus them mentality, which may cause conflict with wider society. The leader is not accountable to any authorities. This is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host, Palsy. You are listening to Papa Pilgrim, Part 3. This week, we'll continue with the life of the family in New Mexico. I'm going to make some changes, though. I will be referring to Bobby as Papa, Kirina as Country Rose, and Butterfly Elizabeth as Elishaba, as that is the name that she has chosen to go by now. If you have not listened to the first two parts, I suggest that you pause here and go back to listen. This way, the story will make more sense. I'm going to give a blanket trigger warning for this episode. I will be covering some sensitive topics which may be triggering. Please be aware of this when you listen. I'd like to kick off this episode by discussing the relationship between Elisha Ba and Papa. If you can recall from the previous episode, when Elisha Ba was younger, Papa liked to take showers with her. He also liked to bath with young Aliyah when they still lived on the commune in Apple Valley. Well, Papa had a very, let's say, unusual relationship with Elisha Ba. He would make her kiss him every morning, and yes, I know this is not a bad thing but he would also be very jealous of her. Like, if she was friendly with or even spoke to another man, he would get incredibly angry with her and call her a Jezebel. Now, keep in mind that while he was saying these things, she was between two and seven years old. She was a very friendly child and wanted to be kind to people. So each time her father berated her, it confused the hell out of her. A child that small could not possibly understand what he meant. Later on, he would make her rub his feet as well. And if she didn't do it just the way he liked it, he would claim it was because she didn't love him. He held this threat over her often, and she would be mortified at losing her father's love. He had carefully orchestrated the relationship in such a way that she would only want to please him. Else he would withhold affection from her. In the cabin where the family lived, Papa had an enormous chair where he would sit and preach to his family. He called this his throne. As I mentioned before, they had no running water and needed to gather water for all their needs from the well that Papa had dug. Papa loved to bath, but the children were only allowed to bath once a week in his old bath water even when they were the ones that had to carry all the water from the well to fill his tub. Something I haven't mentioned yet was Papa's rules around bathing. So, 
He had told his family that they were never to be naked in front of one another, ever. They were not even allowed to look down onto their own naked bodies. So when bath time came around, they needed to be covered. All of the members of the family had to be dressed in a shirt and their underwear. Speaking of clothing, the women in the family, who at this point were Country Rose and Elishaba, were not allowed to wear pants. They were only allowed long dresses and shirts that covered all of them. Papa told them that this was because it was written in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 2 verse 5 it says, Women are not to wear men's clothing, and men not to wear women's clothing. Your God hates people who does such things. I've always struggled with this when it comes up in groups that I've covered. Way back in biblical times, men wore tunics. Pants only came later. Pants being deemed male attire came even later than that. So who was the person that decided that what they meant by this point in the Bible was that women can't wear pants? Or am I missing something? Sorry for going off topic. We will also know that point four under the behavioral control on Dr. Hassan's bite model states controlling types of clothing and hairstyles. So we can see how Papa is ruling over his family, kind of like a cult leader. Now, Country Rose's father was still in the picture at this point. He visited, but very rarely. When he did visit, the children were on their best behavior and pretended that everything was moonshine and roses at home. They were even treated well by Papa when he was there. Once he gave Elisha but a small guitar. She was absolutely thrilled by this. But after he left, Papa took it from her and gave it to her brother, saying that girls should not play instruments. That was for boys. Joseph had no interest in the instrument, and to Elishaba's dismay, it stood in the corner gathering dust. One of his rare visits, Dan brought the family a brand new metal bathtub. This was for Country Rose's birthday, and they set it up outside of the little cabin. The children would bring water up from the well to fill the bathtub and the water would be heated by a fire under the tub. Papa would spend a significant amount of time in the tub, soaking and coming up with new revelations, so it became his second throne. I'm going to insert a trigger warning here around sexual exposure, so if this will in any way be uncomfortable to you, please skip over the next few seconds. Now the reason that I brought up the tub is because one day, when Elisha was around 8 years old, Papa called her to him while he was lying in his watery throne. He told Elisha to join him in the tub. She changed into her bathing clothes and climbed into the bath with him. Once she was lying down against his chest, he started pleasuring himself. This action confused and scared the little girl. Of course it would. I mean, this man, who is your father and your spiritual leader, is doing this disgusting thing while you're basically sitting on his lap. With the family growing, Papa finally started to add more rooms to their cabin. He would teach his children that the outside world was evil and that everyone outside of their family was not to be trusted. He told them that the yellow school bus took children to devil school. He also told them how they would burn in an eternal lake of fire if they sinned. Basically, he created the us versus them mentality, where it was their family against the world. Another thing he taught them was that he and only he had the answers and the knowledge, and they had to obey him completely so that they would not end up in hell. Again, similar to a cult leader who keeps his followers close, by claiming that he is the only way through which the followers would be able to reach salvation or be safe from perceived outside evil. I think Papa must have become a little restless up there in the mountains, because he purchased an old bus, which they renovated and made into a makeshift motorhome, and then he set off on a road trip with his family. The kids were not super keen on this, as they were basically now going to travel amongst those evil people from the outside world, people who they were taught to fear and avoid. First they stopped in Texas to visit some family members, and then they drove all over the western part of the US. They would park in church parking lots and get their food from food banks, 
or from dustbins behind shops. At first, the local Christian communities would welcome them with open arms, but each time Papa would become super confrontational about his version of the truth, and they'd be asked to leave. The thing that the children did enjoy most from these travels was that their father treated them well for the most part. He did this because they were in the presence of other people, and he obviously didn't want people asking him any uncomfortable questions. He did, however, demand that the children try to convert the local kids which they were interacting with. When he found out that they hadn't, he would come down on them like a ton of bricks. After about a year on the road, the family returned to the mountain. I think this was also because they had basically worn out their welcome everywhere they had stopped. At this point, if you could believe it, Papa became more radical, even paranoid. He started telling his family that the end was near and that they needed to start preparing for it. He made them dig out caves in the mountain and start storing food there. He told his family that they were predestined to be among God's elect and that only they would receive eternal salvation, as long as they obeyed him. Again, like a cult leader, he created fear of the outside world and an inevitable doomsday, which would keep his family scared enough to make them want to stay with him. Papa and Country Rose argued a lot. She often stood up to him, which obviously made him angry. He then started to pit Elishaba and Country Rose against each other. He went so far as praising Elishaba when she would bring him coffee in the morning and blame her mother for neglecting him. Elishaba started to notice that her mother resented her as well. Their very fragile relationship was even more frayed during this time. Can you imagine having someone make you jealous of your own mother or daughter? I guess he liked the fact that they were vying for his attention, but still, in my opinion, that's just awful. After a time, he rounded up his children and announced that they weren't allowed to listen to their mother anymore, especially when she said anything to contradict him. They were, however, not allowed to say no to her when she made any requests from them. This, combined with them all telling on each other, was another way he kept control over his family. You see, by them all fighting each other to stay in his good books, he basically kept them apart, which meant that no one would have a chance to gang up on him. Whenever any one of the children did anything to displease Papa, he would announce that they were cast out. Now, you would think that this meant that they were kicked out of the house, but I think Papa did this just to emotionally hurt them. Besides, if he had actually kicked them out, then his dream of 21 children would not come to pass, and there would be a very good chance that the children would eventually speak out about what was actually happening up there in the mountains. So when one of his children were cast out, it meant that they could not interact with the family except for doing chores. They would also only be allowed to eat whatever was left over after everyone else had eaten and would receive regular physical punishments. Papa and his wife made amends, and Country Rose fell pregnant again. Papa proselytized that it would be a girl this time. Elishaba was very excited to finally have a little sister in her life. At the age of 12, she was already taking care of her four young brothers, and longed to have a little girl to talk to. Papa made a great fanfare about his next child being a girl, and when Country Rose went into labor, they were all very excited. When the child finally came into the world, it was a boy. Instead of celebration, however, the mood was a little sombre in the cabin. I think Papa was angry and, or maybe even embarrassed, that he had proclaimed that it would be a girl and it wasn't. He may also have been afraid that he was wrong and it would lead to him being questioned about the revelations and teachings that he had given the family. His wife and children, however, were way too afraid of him to openly take him on about this. They named that young boy Israel. Country Rose fell pregnant again soon after this, and in October 1988, the long-awaited little girl was finally born. She was named Jerusalem. At first, Elishaba doted over Jerusalem, 
but it wasn't long before Papa managed to drive a wedge between the sisters by showing more affection to Jerusalem and even having her sleep where Elishaba used to and relegating Elishaba to the foot of the bed. Again, I can't really understand why he would have a little girl be jealous of her baby sister. The only reason I can think of for this was to ensure Elishaba's devotion would only be focused on Papa and that she wouldn't be able to ally with Jerusalem or conspire against him. Or maybe he was just one of those a-holes who liked it when women fought over him, even though these were his own wife and daughters. Papa had decided that the names of the months and days were pagan names, so the family were to refer to them as first month or second day. He also changed his punishment tool of choice. When the kids were young, he made them take a branch from a tree which they referred to as a switch, but as they got older, he changed it to a braided whip. When Elishaba was between 12 and 13, there were still some times when she would be allowed to sleep between her mother and her father. Sometimes at night, when Papa thought that she was sleeping, he would put his hands in her underwear, but didn't do more than that. Not that this was okay in any way. When Elisha Berg became aware of her body, she was punished for it. But something changed in the way her father looked at her. Whenever she would talk about getting married one day and have a family of her own, Papa would tell her that there was no one out there for her in this life, in this evil world. She would have to wait for the kingdom of God to come before she could get married. Possessive much? By the time she was 14, he decided that he was going to start calling Elizabeth by her new name, Elishaba. He had found it somewhere in the Bible and liked it. On the 21st of June, 1990, another baby girl, Hosanna, was born. The family had now grown to ten, two adults and eight children. The family's flock of sheep was also growing in number, so when they couldn't find anywhere for them to graze on their own land, they would go over to a neighbor's land. The sheep were very important to the family, as their wool provided income and their meat provided much-needed food. Papa would tell them that trespassing on other people's property was okay, because those people were sinners, and God wanted to provide for them. He would go on to teach his children that taking from others was not a sin, because they were taking what they needed from sinners. The boys would at time go around to their neighbors' barns and help themselves to whatever equipment was needed on the mountain. In 1993, Billy, Papa's twin brother, had become very religious. He and two young men showed up on the mountain, claiming that the young men wanted to become Papa's disciples. Billy also wanted to know how life worked on the farm. Papa often spoke to Billy about getting Patsy and the kids in Texas and bringing them to their farm. Billy wasn't very keen on this, because they were very much of the world and liked their creature comforts, like running water and electricity. Papa eventually persuaded Billy to let him accompany him to Fort Worth to try and get Patsy up to the mountain. He insisted that Elishaba and Jerusalem accompany them. Country Rose didn't want him to take the girls with him. I think by this time, she suspected that Papa didn't have the greatest of intentions with his own little girls. But Papa, being Papa, won the argument and took them along to Texas. Billy and the young men rode in the car while Papa and the girls huddled under a blanket in the back of a bucky. Truck for those listening overseas. When they reached Fort Worth, they camped out in the Hell's front yard while they tried to convince Patsy to come back with them. She obviously refused. Papa even sent the girls in at one point to try to get their aunt to come home with them, but this didn't work either. Patsy eventually took their four kids and went to stay with a nearby relative to get away from the brothers. They continued to camp in the front yard. They were raiding the food cupboards and the fridge in the house and attempted to convert people over to their side by preaching in the streets. Eventually, Billy and Papa got into a heated argument. Papa took his goals and left for New Mexico the next day. Billy stayed behind. I'm not quite sure what happened to the two young men. They did drive Papa and the girls back to the mountain, but they're not mentioned again. My guess is that they probably got tired of Papa's rules, 
were most likely treated badly and ended up leaving, but I have no idea what really happened. Alienating people was something that Papa was really good at. He would tell his wife and kids that he wanted to meet a family with similar values to them so that they could all live together. But whenever they came close to this sort of thing, Papa would inevitably end up arguing with them and they would leave. I kind of feel like he did this on purpose so that he could keep control over his family without having any outside influence or another point of view that would contradict his version of the Bible. Life on the mountain was not great to start with, but things started taking it another turn. Papa and Country Rose had another two more sons named Noah and Abraham. They were now up to ten children, not counting Hope. In 1995, after Elisha Bo had turned 19, her brothers confronted Papa about the way he had been treating them. He decided that this rebellion must have stemmed from the time where Country Rose didn't want the girls to accompany him to Texas, because that makes sense. Obviously, it could never have been the way he treated them. He was a blameless saint. So he punished the boys and Country Rose for good measure. He banned them from the cabin to the shed and told them to wait until he had decided a suitable punishment for them. When they were out of the cabin, he called Elisha to him and proclaimed that she was to become his new queen and take her mother's place beside him and to serve him. He claimed that his wife was no longer worthy of the role. This must have confused the hell out of her. Here is her father and spiritual leader telling her that she was to assume the role of wife. That is insane, but that's not even the worst bit. I'll get to that a bit later in this episode. When he had made this crazy announcement to Elisha, he then called his two sons, Joseph and Joshua, the two who had stood up to him, and interrogated them. He finally decided on a punishment. He was going to have them bend over a barrel and beat them with a bullwhip. He made Elisha keep the younger children in the house while he whipped them outside. He tossed country rows to put a cloth in their mouths to stifle their screams. When he was done whipping them, he went inside the house and made Elisha rub his hands because he claimed that they hurt. The whippings would happen every morning for the next few weeks. Papa would be kinder to Elisha than her other siblings and her mother, and always refer to her as his queen. This caused an even bigger rift in the family, causing the children to really start resenting Elisha. He then began to emotionally blackmail her. He would tell her that he was going to leave her mom, take her and the siblings, and live in the wilderness. She would beg him not to do this, and he would promise to stay with her mom as long as she would fulfill his heart's needs. She obviously promised him this, not knowing just how sick his needs would become. That summer, Billy returned. Patsy had refused to join him in New Mexico, so he had given up on convincing her and decided to return to them alone. Papa, Billy, Elisha, Jerusalem and Hosanna went camping one evening, and on that night, Papa said to Elisha, I want you to understand this. Your calling in life is to be here for me in everything I do. It is your God-given gift to serve me emotionally, physically, medically, and in every way. No one else on earth can do this for me but you. If you do these things, I will forgive the family. You can be the savior of our family. How hectic would it be for a 19-year-old to have to carry such a burden? It must have been such an emotional mindfuck to hear this from her dad. I'm going to throw a trigger warning in here because I'll be speaking about sexual assault. So if this is in any way triggering, please skip over the next few seconds. Papa and Elisha were sitting in the makeshift bath when he said this to her. And then, for the first time while touching himself, he slid his fingers inside of her. When he was done... Elisha Ba went back to a makeshift sleeping area at the camp, and, with her two sisters sleeping soundly nearby, her father slid in bed next to her and continued to touch her inappropriately for hours. The next morning, he warned her that what had happened needed to remain a secret between just the two of them, 
typical abuser line. It makes me so mad because this poor girl had nowhere to run and this was her own father. This was emphasized when he told her that he had dreams and visions of this thing between them happening and if she ever went against him, she was basically going against God. When they got home, Papa called Country Rose aside. He must have told her what he had done because she started screaming at him. He then in turn started hitting her. And when she stopped screaming, he dragged her outside by her hair and announced that she was no longer to be listened to at all. He then proclaimed that Elishaba was the new mother of the family. He even went as far as taking little Abraham from Country Rose's arms and declaring that Elishaba was his mother now. Elishaba was mortified. This announcement upset Country Rose hugely, and rightfully so, but she stayed there and even continued sharing a bed with Papa. I guess she really had nowhere else to go, and even if she did, she didn't have the means to leave. Papa then announced that everyone was going on a preaching trip. Everyone, except Country Rose, that is. As they travelled and camped, Papa's physical demands on Elisha Bob intensified. It seemed like Billy realised what had been going on. I mean, how couldn't he? They were all camped in very close proximity to each other. When he finally confronted Papa about it, Papa merely asked him to show in the Bible where it had said what they were doing was wrong. Well, it seems that he may not have known the Bible well enough to argue this point with his brother, so he left it. I don't know how he, a father of daughters himself, was able to let this go. Papa must have had a huge influence over him to be able to dampen his instincts on this, not to mention that it was illegal and just plain wrong. When Elisha finally built up the courage to tell her father that what he was doing felt wrong, he beat her with his fists. And remember, he was an accomplished boxer. Country Rose joined them after two months, and she seemed to have calmed down in her anger about the situation. Papa had another one of his biblical revelations. He had read in 1 Peter that Abraham's wife had started calling him Lord out of reverence for him as a holy man. As such, Papa wanted Country Rose and Elisha to start referring to him as Lord as well. He then started spending less time reading his Bible and more making excuses to spend time alone with Elisha so that he could carry on his sick assault on her. Remember from our previous episode, he did have quite a sexual appetite back in the hippie commune, and I'm pretty sure it didn't go away. He also got a revelation that he was now to start drinking wine. He would make Elisha drink with him to make her more compliant. He is a disgusting human being, but this is just my opinion. When she eventually started to refuse to drink, he had another one of his revelations. One day when some of the animals had escaped, he said that she would find a seven-pronged antler while looking for the animals, and this would be proof that their union was ordained by God. She reluctantly went out searching for it, but to her relief, couldn't find one. That relief was short-lived, however. Her brother came back a day later with a six-pronged antler. Papa examined the antler closely, and exclaimed that a part where it had splintered must have been where a seventh prong was broken off. Everyone that looked at it could clearly see that this wasn't true, but they wouldn't dare argue with Papa. Sometime after this, Country Rose gave birth to another son, who they named Job. The family's trespassing and poaching of animals and objects that did not belong to them started to catch up with them. The neighbours had realised that the hells were responsible for the cuts in the fences and the items that had gone missing from their barns. A few of them had even reported the family to the police. There were more and more people starting to move to the mountain, so the family were no longer as secluded as they used to be. Papa was also deathly afraid of CPS coming up and taking the children away from him. I think more so because all of his abuse and his disgusting behaviour would come to light. In our next episode, 
we will continue with the family's life in the mountains and follow them to the great plains of Alaska. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. Please invite your family and friends to listen. If you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe and like the video. You can also leave a comment. You can find me on Facebook and you can email me at decodingcults at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult which you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that I sent you. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.